This series is the story of the new amphibious Arctic vehicle project named Bernard. Building on ideas, skills and questions raised during the Allen lifeboat conversion, as a team we will share all those moments needed to get Bernard up north, onto the ice and making himself useful. Good people of the channel, hello. Um, I thought instead of talking to you and doing a little monologue when I get to the yard, get to the workshop, I thought instead that I would chat to you on the way there in my new rental vehicle. You'll probably notice I have a different car every time uh, you see it in a clip. Anyway, we've been doing a lot of composites and mold stuff in previous episodes, and I thought we'd do a bit of a switch up this time round, in particular because a few of you have been commenting in the comment section about what about the drivetrain, what about wheels, what about this, what about that, as if I've just forgotten about all the other components of the burner project. Of course I haven't. So I'm going to talk to you and show you a little bit of progress today on the idea that we have for wheels. Uh, we have decided that the vehicle is going to be wheeled and not tracked. There's a whole load of reasons behind that which have been discussed before but I'll probably uh, delve into a little bit more later on. Uh, and those wheels are going to be airless. We're not going to be using inflatable balloon tyres, which will upset some of you, but bear with us. I think this is a, a, pre a pretty stonking idea. And I'm not just going to go straight in and make a 1.3 metre diameter wheel from scratch. Quite usefully, I have a concurrent project in my sort of normal Arctic sledging world in that I'm trying to reduce friction when hauling a sledge over, um, over snow and ice. In particular, when snow is very cold, down below sort of minus 30, minus 35 degrees, you do get elevated uh, friction. And that can be a problem with sledge runners, even if those sledge runners are made out of ultra, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. And I wonder whether in certain circumstances, it might be a good idea to actually have a, a wheeled sledge, super lightweight wheels that can be removed for different sorts of terrain, particularly when it gets bumpy and jagged. Uh, but it might mean that if you can use proper cold rated bearings, you might be able to get a much lower friction and therefore easier to haul. Now, that coincides with the fact that um, I need to make these large wheels for Bernard. And what do you know? They're pretty much the same brief, apart from the fact that the wheels on Bernard will be actively powered whereas the ones on the bottom of a sled will simply need to grip onto the snow so that they don't skid as they're pulled by me over the snow. So, what if I was going to make a small prototype for the Bernard wheels, which is also a functional wheel for sledges? So, I'm going to do that. We're going to make a mould, and then we're going to work out how the structure is going to be made of uh, springy composites, uh, some unidirectional, unidirectional carbon fibre, and some, uh, some cast polyurethane tread. So that's what I'm going to do. Talk to you in a second. And here we are a second later. Now I have filmed this at the end of the day, not the beginning of the day, so I'm doing it out of sequence and you'll probably be able to tell that because of that I look tired and sweaty because it's hot again. We're having a super heat wave here. Anyway, I have this laser cut circle of MDF. I got this cut on eBay. You just told someone what dimensions you wanted. They just quickly did it for you. It cost a fiver. And this is quite useful because it's really hard to get a, a guide for a custom circle. I guess you could trace it onto a piece of paper. But anyway, if you're trying to then trace this onto a piece of MDF or another form of um, uh, substrate, metal, whatever it is, then it's useful just to have this. And it's because this is going to be my um, I think probably the diameter of the wheel that we're going to be creating as the prototype, but also the sledge wheel. Uh, not too big, not too small, and I haven't just come up with this number out of thin air. I have worked out the height at which I would like the sledge to be above the ground, where the position of the axle is likely to be, so on, so on. So I think this will be a good, uh, happy medium, um, because obviously the bigger it is, the heavier it's going to be, um, and if it's too small, it won't function properly. So you've got to get all the things, uh, all the things right. Okay, I will. Um, now build the wheel mold <laughs> we're making another mold and then I'll get that home and actually I'll do that laminating um, back where I live because it's just a bit easier and I've got the unidirectional actually where where I am living right now because I was doing some tests um, where I'm living my home right work piece the camera Alex really does drone on voiceover Alex is much more succinct and just better in general here I'm using the laser cut template to transfer the 400mm diameter circle onto some offcuts from the sheets of moisture resistant MDF I made Bernard's mould formers from. I thought about using three discs, but I think two will do here as the mould is only going to be a little over 400mm thick and I have a plan to make sure the cylinder ends up true and not skew. It would be enormously easy to create something with one or more of the many axes out of whack. 
I know when cutting these sorts of curves you should use a router, but I don't have one. But I do have a jigsaw with a zero swing precision mode, a quality blade, and world class patience and concentration that last for precisely one minute at a time. So lots more cutting. Not an angle grinder, I grant you, but grinding obsessives in the comment section may spot the brief use of one, a mini grinder, little later on. We end up with two identical, strong, 400mm diameter discs, and these can form the two ends of our cylindrical mould. For clarity, this is the wide rim of the airless wheel I want to create. Outside of this will be a grippy disc, or a series of pads of ridged polyurethane tread, and inside we will create one form or another of springy spokes made out of composites. In the centre, a hub, which will likely be bought off the shelf and made from stainless steel or carbon fibre. The edges aren't perfect, but are easily good enough for what we're up to here, as there's a polyethylene skin due to run around the edges shortly. I could now merely batten around the edges with square planks of the appropriate length, and rely on that for orientating the discs, keeping them perfectly parallel on top of one another across the gap, but let's instead find the centre of the circles and run a spindle as well. There are many ways to find a center, and I've actually used this messy but fast approximating method to good effect in the past. That is, drawing a whole load of lines across the piece spanning lengths of the full diameter. The intersections should cross at the center. But this is tricky by eye, as the widest points are difficult to find as they differ only by a millimeter or two. You end up with an approximation, but not good enough here. Instead, one of the proper techniques for you. You draw a square inside the circle. Not a rectangle, a square. Then, of course, you have four equidistant corners, from where you can draw two lines from corner to corner, and the cross in the middle is the centre. As you can see, it's near to the mark from the spider's web method, but far enough away to make it matter, and it only took around twice the time to do so. I checked the pilot hole is equidistant from the perimeter on both discs. It was, and so we're away. Or nearly. First, it's worth seeing how well it spins. These will never be perfectly balanced due to the speed and the method that we manufactured them, but we are close. It's also light to moderate entertainment for someone who's been sweating in the tent for days working on a mould that has a sense of humour that only partly aligns with mine. Oh, Bernard. Anyhow, temporary screws come out, wood is cut to length, and the spindle goes in. It reminds me of the fishing line spindle I used years ago with an Inuk friend to bring up through the sea ice hundreds of metres of line with dozens of halibut hooks on whilst living in the far north of Greenland. Similarly robust. Now, lots of strips of carefully square-cut MDF from the off-cut pile once more. Much cutting was done, and the breeze arrived on cue to carry away the dust. I guess you could place an almost infinite number of these, and the more you do, the better the circular form of the cylinder will be when the plastic skin goes on. If that orange table, or the table formerly known as orange, could talk, the stories it could tell. Let's get them fitted. All, of course, placed right up to the edge of the discs. I considered using wood glue or grab adhesive here, but then thought it would be useful to be able to dismantle it, perhaps if a release is tricky, later, without inflicting wanton violence upon it and all around it. I'm fairly chuffed with today's creation. For the first time we can get a sense of the wheel dimensions. The diameter is of course spot on, but the width of the eventual wheel is a little narrower than this form shows at the moment. You want spare wastage either side for a clean lamination and cut. But yes, these wheels are wide. The reason is that even with squishy rims, we need the surface area in contact with snow and ice to be large enough to apply a low ground pressure, otherwise the sledge will sink deep into the powder snow. You may recognise the HDPE sheet I'm now pinning on and tightly winding around the cylinder. Yes, it's the stuff from Bernard's mould that I terminated the employment contract of last episode. It'll do just fine here, and is already the correct width. Nice work, and the next you'll see of it is back home for the lamination. A quick update now from the tent of Dante's roasting hot fifth circle of hell. It's still fairly warm in here and I've been super busy. It's 32 degrees and it's uh, getting on for seven in the evening, so hopefully that will start calming down a little bit soon. Um, anyway, I've done the replacement of this. Um, this is now all polypropylene on this edge. That was always polypropylene over there. All the HDPE is off because it wasn't conforming to the right radius. This is a lot more work than, than it looks. You've got to make sure that all of the joints here between the bits of polypropylene are flush and they don't naturally want to be a, a, want to end up flush and so it's a lot of um, bespoke screwing activity that goes on and then obviously I can tape the joints later on but you still need to start with a flat surface to start. Um, the filling, I've, I'm on my fourth iteration of correcting little filling errors and we're getting damn close to the point where I can skin that in fiberglass and be done with it because You'll be shocked to hear um, 
I'm getting quite bored of this job. I really want to get onto drivetrain, exciting stuff like that. I have a, has a slight um, hold up in China. The guys who are making the custom uh, gearbox and motor mount, they're having a slight problem coupling one to the other, but they're being very good at communicating about it. They're solving problems. They're not creating them and then making them my problem, which is exactly what I like to see from a custom manufacturer. So that's good news. Uh, fingers crossed that will be with us in the next few weeks and you'll be able to see the first full size gear motor and we'll rig it up to 48 volts and see what happens. In the meantime, you can watch me take over my living room floor for a prototype wheel rim lamination. Spare glass fibre outer and inner skins as it's cheap and wets out easily, and then a double layer of unidirectional carbon captured inside, which I promise is not a precursor to making a pressure vessel in a do-it-yourself deep sea submersible. Disturbingly similar though. I talked about why I'm likely to spray resin in the future instead of spreading or brushing. Pouring and spreading like this works, but to avoid resin-starved areas you'd normally overdose with resin, expensive and heavy. We achieved a good wet out here, and then lots of fin rolling to puff out any air, compress the layers and wet out the carbon. Unidirectional is notoriously slow to wet out. It's like a barrier. So to the finale for this episode, and there is a reason why I am slightly obscured by this large white good to my right. Um, I've bought myself a minus 45 degree rated freezer and that means I can test all sorts of electrics and plastics and composites and all sorts of things. I might even do another sodium ion battery test once it's a little bit more sophisticated and doing it properly, properly cold temperatures because we only managed minus 22 before. Um, anyway, that aside, although I can't really move this aside right now, it's quite heavy, uh, the layout went really well. The uh, carbon uh, cured really, really nicely and it's in a perfect shape. I can't see any problems with the um, uh, with the compaction and with the consolidation between the glass and the carbon. The only thing is, and there's a reason why I'm not currently showing you <laughs> the part off the mould. You can see that the mould is in the middle. Yeah, it's not coming off. And I knew this was probably going to be an issue. I thought it would be slightly wishful thinking to have the idea that the uh, the release on the HDP would be so easy that I could just slide it off. Now normally for this sort of cylinder you would use a mandrel that either uses heat to release afterwards or the reduction in heat because you, you'd use a metal mandrel or you would use a disappearing core where you use a solvent to dissolve what's inside uh, and so you have to create a new one each time. Uh, I'm probably going to have to exact some violence upon this one even after unscrewing the top. I don't think it's going to come off and out really neatly. I'm also probably not going to use this long term as a uh, replicatable mould because I will want to use probably like a strip of styrofoam around the outside of a slightly smaller mould which, which can then be solvent uh, melted every time I do one of these pieces so I can use the inner mould permanently but then just keep on replacing the outer bit with a removable uh, bit, of, um, uh, bit of polystyrene foam which in, in lots of solvents just disappears and I'll be able to slide it off. I don't want to use a heated mandrel because it would be super expensive and I don't think it would work very well for this part. Uh, I think we're gonna have to use that magic disappearing core and I can't do that this time round. So um, I'm not gonna show you me ripping this to pieces right now because it's my flat and I don't want to get bits and shards of stuff all over the place but I promise uh, we're another cliffhanger that one with the water tap was brutal I know. I will get that done for uh, a subsequent episode and you'll see how this, um, it's only four layer thick, um, outside rim works. Cheers. Bye.